All right, real, real raw study the Bible with David Newland. I'm your host, David Newland. Um, we're going to go into uh, Matthew chapter 22. We're just going to read through it. I've only got a few here for you just so this format won't take too long. Uh, but if you want to go to thebiblestudymethod.com, you're going to download, you're going to be able to download a free guide to studying the Bible for any believer, any Christian, leader, pastor, teacher. It's called the Amateur Bible Study Method. Surprise, okay? Um, and it's some, it's a combination of uh, what I've learned so far and what's helped me so far study the Bible, which I believe is one of the most essential things that every believer should know how to do. Because if you don't know how to study the Word of God, which is the truth of God, then how can you really know God, right? So <clears throat> go to thebiblestudymethod.com and download your free copy, okay? That's a shameless plug. Um, the things I teach in there mainly, pray, observe, interpret, apply. Pray because you want to speak to the author, which is God, ultimately the author of the whole Bible, and, and he's the one who orchestrated it all together and inspired all the people that wrote the Bible down. And then in observe, which is to ask, what does it say? Like, what are you actually reading there? And what are you observing is present in the text itself? Not your opinion, not your thoughts, not your perspective, but what does it actually say? Interpret means, what does it mean? So take the observations, which are just facts, and you interpret it to, to something that is a true statement that is not easily seen there. Uh, a truth statement or a principle that will be true no matter who says it, and, and especially if you give context to your truth statement. And then from that truth statement, that principle, that interpretation, you finish with application, which is asking the question, how does this change me? You take the observation, you take the interpretation, and you ask the question, how does this change me? Not everything in the Bible is about you and me, but everything in it can change you. I will continue to preach that and teach that um, because it's true. Uh, the Bible is not written to us, but it certainly was written for our benefit and for our transformation. So let's pray before we read this ver these verses. Father God, thank you so much that you have given us everything that we need to be able to know you fully. And maybe we don't know everything about you and we won't know everything of who you are, but we thank you that what you have revealed to us, uh, we can access and we can know you, and that you're going to reveal this truth to us in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 22, reading from the NIV. I think um, this is the NIV, correct. So Jesus spoke to them again in parables, or a story with a, with a lesson, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention at all and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city then he said to his servants the wedding banquet is ready but those i invited did not deserve to come so go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find so the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find the bad as well as the good and the wedding hall was filled with guests but when the king came in to see the guests he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. These are the words of Jesus. Um, and this is the story that is considered the, the wedding banquet story. Um, if you just look at what you can observe here, there's a lot going on, right? It's a, it's a full-blown story. Jesus has a setup, an uh, introduction, a body, and a, and a whole conclusion, and even a plot twist there towards the end. And if you're just looking at it at face value, it's very easy to miss maybe some of the 
overarching themes that Jesus is trying to share to us. Um, but I've read this before and I've been able to study this before. I just haven't planned everything I'm going to say here. But mainly what you can observe is that Jesus starts describing the kingdom of heaven. Okay, even the, the whole story about a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son is just and all the way through to the end uh, where he says the king told his attendants tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All of it from the beginning to the end and in the middle is Jesus describing the kingdom of heaven. That's how he sets it up. And so to a certain extent, we can take the things that Jesus has described in the, the whole story and we can attribute attributes of heaven to or the attributes of this story to attributes of the kingdom of heaven. So what do we notice? Um, the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding banquet. That's something you can observe. Okay, I'm not writing this down for you, for you to see, but that's something you can observe. Um, he said the, the king prepared the wedding banquet for his son. That's another thing you can observe, right? He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. So, but, but they refused to come. So what does that tell us? Originally, there were an invited group of people. There was an invited group of people that the king had in mind to attend his son's wedding banquet. And what does that start to sound like? And we could start moving into interpretation a little bit. We'll bounce back and forth. Um, and continuing, Jesus said, he sent some more servants. And he said, tell those who have been invited that I prepared my dinner. So it's still in sending the same servants, not the same servants, more servants to the same group of people that were originally invited. But they kept paying no attention, went off to their own field, another to their business. Uh, the rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. And the king was enraged. So what is Jesus trying to parallel with that part of the story? He's trying to parallel, and this is the interpretation where you could ask, what does it mean? Knowing the context of who he's speaking to and who he's describing, he's trying to parallel these statements with Israel. That Israel was the original chosen people of God. That God originally invited to the wedding banquet for his son. That God originally sent more and more servants, more and more prophets to preach and invite people into the wedding banquet of his son. But they refused. They refused. They ignored. And some even went to the extent of killing the same servants and messengers and prophets that God sent to invite them to his son's wedding banquet. So that's what Jesus is setting up here. He's trying to show them, and these people largely can start to get the, the, the picture that Jesus was painting, that God sent his prophets first to Israel. Then he said to his servants, when they already refused, and he sent an army, destroyed their city, um, the wedding banquet's ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. And they found people, guess what? The bad as well as the good. So now God goes from inviting just the people of Israel or just this select group that he originally favored. And he tells the servants to invite everyone. The bad, the good, the known, the unknown, the far, the near, the tall, the short, the men, the women. He invited everyone and the servants invited everyone they could find. And what does that sound like? Jesus and his gospel the message of salvation through faith in Jesus is offered to every single person. And so they all come in. But here's the plot twist. They all come in there. But then the king notices a man who was uh, wearing wedding clothes. And he asks, well, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? So they're all invited. And they all, uh, well, not all of them, but they're all invited. But a lot, and a lot of them show up. But then there's one more, um, there's one more, a wrench that Jesus throws in there, so uh, at least it seems like it, where he asks, how'd you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And the man was speechless. The king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. And now what does that mean for us? I mean, the interpretation is that everyone's invited to eat of the feast, to receive the salvation that comes from faith in Jesus. Everyone's invited to that. But only few are chosen. Not because God makes people not want to choose Him, 
and not because God makes people choose him. Everyone's invited, but the few that are chosen to actually enter are the ones who are entering with the right kind of clothes on. And the right kind of clothes on, and this is where we can start to move into application a little bit, where how does this change me? The right kind of clothes on to wear to this wedding banquet are wedding clothes. But wh how does that translate to us today? That when you receive the salvation that comes from Jesus, what you are actually putting on as far as clothes is you are wearing his righteousness. That is the, the, those are the only clothes that will allow you into the kingdom of heaven. The, the clothing of perfect righteousness. But you cannot attain that on your own. You cannot put that together on your own. You can sew a bunch of nice silk and, and wool and cotton and what else? Give me another piece of fabric, Nikki. Satin. You could, you could sew all these nice pieces of fabric together and still it would not be perfectly what the king requires to attend in his wedding banquet for his son. Because the only clothes that matter, the only clothes that fit are the clothes of perfect righteousness that we can have only through faith in Jesus. And so this is part of where you can apply it in your life as far as asking yourself what kind of clothes are you trying to wear to get into God's kingdom, into the kingdom of heaven? Are you trying to wear the clothes of your own righteousness, of your own good deeds? Are you in your pride and in your ego trying to wear the clothes of your reputation and your image and, and how highly people think of you? Is that how you're trying to get into heaven? How much you give to charity? How much you, you do for other people? All great things, by the way. Of course you want to have good reputation. Of course you want to do things for others. But if that is what you think will get you into the kingdom of heaven, you are sadly mistaken. And the king will look you in the face and say, how'd you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? And we'll have to, be, we'll have to give account. And the account that we give will not be sufficient to keep us in that place, to actually allow us to enter the, the kingdom of heaven. The only thing that counts and the only thing that will matter and the only thing that the king is looking for is that we're wearing the clothes of righteousness that come from faith in Jesus because he was righteous, not you, not me, because he was righteous, he was perfect, he was sinless, and he died the death that we deserve. And so that's how it can change us because we're not going to, Every day, we're not going to depend on our righteousness. We, are receive, we receive the righteousness from God through faith in Jesus, His Son, and then we walk it out and we show it with our lives. We live up to what we are wearing. Just like if I'm, if I'm wearing uh, my, my, <laughs> my basketball jersey, I'm going to live up to be a, being a basketball player. But I put it on before I go out to play on a, in a game, right? And so maybe that's not the perfect analogy, but hopefully you start to get what I'm saying. So I encourage you uh, to meet with me uh, next week. This will be live again at 10 p.m. Central Standard Time. You know, we'll try around that time. I know I've been late a couple nights here, but um, I want you to learn that you can study the Bible. Anyone can study the Bible and tell your mom, your dad, your sister, brother, son, daughter, your dog, that they can study the Bible. No, not your dog, but you get it. That you can study the Bible and you can learn um, and go to the BibleStudyMethod.com. God bless.